Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the 12, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Beloved, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the one whose mercies are new every morning. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I had lunch with a colleague in, up in Seattle, a Lutheran pastor, and I told him that I was going to get to spend this time here with you and that I was looking forward to this. And he said, on New Day in Gig Harbor, isn't that where there are a whole bunch of retired pastors? <laughs> So I need to know, friends, hands up, confess, any retired pastors here this morning? Or, or, or yes, I, I, I imagined that you might be. <laughs> um, I ask because it is a great privilege to uh, stand in this role, and I wanted to know who might have shared that as well. It is a privilege to bring the good news of the gospel news that is sacred, news that is hopeful, sermons that share the story of God's faithfulness, God's embodied grace in Jesus, stories of God's unending love for all people. And when a sermon is preached, it's, it's not just the preacher talking, it is a conversation, if you will, between the text that we heard read this morning and, and what I say and what you bring to this place. And when a pastor and people know each other well, that is a great gift because the preaching is deepened, because you know each other's stories. You know stories of Pastor Seth apparently setting the baptismal font water on fire at one point. And I acknowledge and I hold with care the multitude of emotions that you might be feeling in this season. So one of the things that informs my story and my understanding of God, one of the things, if you will, that I bring with me to this place is that I was raised in the American South. And I lived there until I went to seminary in 2001. There is such a particular culture in the South. Not all of it is lovely and beautiful, but some of it is. But one of the things about the South is that if you are going through a hard time, Maybe uh, you are a parent of someone who has just gone off to the military or to college or to kindergarten. Um, maybe you are sick or recuperating from illness. Maybe someone you love has died. Maybe you have lost your job or you're about to start a new one. But one of the things that Southerners do in situations like that is they bring you food because food will heal a multitude of things and it can't ever hurt, right? So you might get a pie or a banana pudding or a casserole or a baked ham or some delicious freshly grown green beans along with a big jar of sweet tea because food is the love language of the church in the South. When my daughter was born, I was serving a church as a music minister, and I did not have to cook for six weeks because they <laughs> took care of us very well. They loved us, and they showed us God's love through their hospitality. 
So today's very short gospel reading contains the final verses of the 10th chapter of Matthew. And it's helpful for context to go all the way back to the end of the ninth chapter. Jesus has gone to all the cities and villages, we're told, and he's teaching and he's preaching and he's healing. And now he gathers the disciples together and he says, you know, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot to do. But the laborers are few. And then he prays that God will send more laborers. And then I like to think that Jesus looked meaningfully at the disciples when he said that. And then as chapter 10 opens, Jesus draws the 12 disciples together. He gives them authority. He says, you can cast out clean, unclean spirits. You can heal. And then he begins a litany of very specific instructions that goes on for 38 verses. You've been hearing some of those verses for the past few weeks out of Matthew 10. Jesus covers a lot. He covers where the disciples should go and where they shouldn't go, what they should take with them, what they should leave at home, where they should stay, and how they should act in the houses where they stay what they should do if people disagree with them, or what they should do if they become afraid. He begins to wrap up the chapter by talking about the personal costs of discipleship. And when he gets to the end, he concludes by discussing the importance of hospitality. Congregations are wise to think about hospitality as a part of their mission. After all, Jesus said in this passage, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. It's tempting to let this be the end of our thinking about this, the whole point of Jesus' instruction. And make no mistake, genuine hospitality to and for all people is a hallmark of Christian community. How we provide that looks different from context to context. It's a warm welcome. It's saying, it's good to meet you. I'm Julie. You're Phyllis. It might be an invitation to stay for coffee hour or to have donuts on the playground, which I might add they were doing this morning when I got here. Or it might be a casserole or a tray of deviled eggs delivered when you are in need. Curiously, though, Jesus says, whoever gives even a cup of cold water, just a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, even a cup of cold water, if these words were coming from anyone but Jesus, I would say that the point was that even our smallest signs of hospitality are welcome. And they are. The smallest acts of welcome can make the biggest difference. And in the ministries that the disciples would soon undertake as laborers in the vineyard and a season when they would be walking wherever they were going, an actual cup of cold water might be exactly what they needed. Still, whenever we encounter something that Jesus is saying, it's worth looking at it from all sides. Because a cup of cold water is very specific. It made me wonder, where else in scripture do we hear about little portions of water making a difference? Well, in Genesis 18, Abraham is sitting under the oak trees at Mamre, and the Lord appears to him in the form of three beings, and the first thing Abraham does, the first thing Abraham offers them, just a little bit of water for them to wash their feet with, which 
is an act we would see Jesus do much later. And in Luke 16, we have the story of a rich man who feasted extravagantly while a poor man named Lazarus went hungry at his doorstep. And when Lazarus dies, he's carried off to heaven to feast with Abraham. And when the rich man dies, he is tormented in Hades. And what does he ask of Abraham in this story? He says, tell Lazarus just to dip his finger in some cold water. Just, just a dipped finger in cold water. In John 4, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at the well, and he tells her to draw a bucket of water. And in that robust conversation that follows, Jesus tells her that he is living water. Friends, perhaps, perhaps a cup of cold water is more than it seems at first. In the quenching of physical thirst, perhaps a deeper thirst is also satisfied. Jesus is, in the way that Jesus often does, reminding the disciples of something more than what it seems on the surface. He's telling them that sometimes the deepest of needs are met in the most simple acts. And this is a good reminder for us, too. It's easy to think that we have very little to offer the very real pressing problems of our day. That we cannot solve the many ills of our time. That the shortage of affordable housing and economic disparity and food insecurity and post-pandemic educational struggles and the protection of basic rights for everyone, basic rights for all people, that those are problems that are just too big for us to handle. And Jesus says to us, offer a cup of cold water. Give what you can. Do what you can. It's also worth noting that in the gospel reading this morning, it is a little bit unclear who is giving the cold water and who is receiving the cold water. Sometimes we are the ones doing the giving. And sometimes we will be the thirsty recipients. So this gift of welcome, of deep and genuine hospitality, is a hallmark of healthy Christian community. And for your welcome of this pastor in this season, I thank you. This week in our country, we will celebrate Independence Day. And I like to think that one of the ways our country shines brightest is when we welcome those who have been unwelcomed elsewhere when we offer that cup of cold water, when we say we're going to figure out a way that snake can play ball. So I'm reminded of the beautiful words that are inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. It's the poem, The New Colossus, and we often hear just the ending stanza, but there's more to it than that. So the poet, who wrote this poem. Her name is Emma Lazarus. I just found that a delightful um, coincidence. You know, we talked about Lazarus and the cold water. Her name is Emma Lazarus. So here are the words that are welcome, words of welcome and hospitality. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, 
cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Hospitality, it's a sign of welcome. Whether it is a mighty woman with a torch or whether it is a little water to wash one's feet or whether it is a cup of cold water or whether it is a finger dipped in just a bit of water. Hospitality as a sign of welcome matters in the lives of all who follow Jesus. Whether we are the givers or whether we are the receivers, that all are welcome, that all are welcome in God's kingdom is the great gift of the gospel. And for this, we give thanks to God. Amen.